This is a short revision video on the circular flow of income, which goes with the National Economy section of Economics AS level with AQA. Here are some really basic definitions that you need to know. One of them is economic models. They are models which are used to show the essential characteristics of complicated economic conditions in order to analyse them and predict the results of changes of variables. I don't know when you'd ever need to use that, I suppose maybe in a definition on a context or a multiple choice. It's just good to know it anyway because that's what they've asked you to learn and you may as well know what an economic model is. The flow is something that's measured over a specific period of time, so in this video we're going to be looking at the circular flow of income, so the way income travels throughout the economy, I suppose in the four sector economy, over a specific time period. Here is the flow of GDP, I suppose you could say, in the economic cycle. Obviously we've got our trend growth and then our actual growth. There's two things that you really ought to be able to define quite well in case they come up, and that's recession and boom. Recession is when the economy is growing at less than a long-term rate of growth. There's a very specific definition you might need in multiple choice, which is when GDP is falling in two successive quarters. That's a quarter of the year, falls in two of them. Obviously, if GDP is falling, this means output is falling, which means that less people are needed to produce stuff, which leads to unemployment, negative multiplier effect, and significant reduction in economic ability to compete against lots of other countries. Then we have our booms which are when we have an increase in output and economic growth, it's pretty good because it means there's lots of employment, but it could be so many people are employed that firms actually struggle to recruit labour because they can't find enough workers. So that's why immigration is actually quite good because more workers come in to fill the gaps that we need filled. In a boom, if demand increases really sharply and much faster than supply, we can get rapid inflation because there's excess demand, so prices have to rise to cancel out this excess demand. So that's inflation, which is pretty bad. And we can also get a balanced payments deficit because people's incomes are rising, so they have increased demand for more luxury products from abroad. So they buy products from abroad, so we're importing a lot more. I mean, we're exporting quite a bit too, but we're importing more than we're exporting, so you've got a growing balanced payments deficit. This is a diagram of the four sector economy. This is the real flow of income. I absolutely hate it. I find it quite difficult to understand, even though it should be quite simple. Quite a lot of people find this to be the case. Injections are the stuff going in, and leakages slash withdrawals are the stuff coming out. Withdrawals are just money that isn't passed on in the circular flow, so it reduces an actual income. For example, if you're spending on imports that money goes away to other countries and it never comes back well except for from exports there are a few terms there you might not be familiar with there's investment which is the spending my firms on buildings machinery improving labor basically if i'm a firm and i want to improve my efficiency and increase my output and productivity of workers and stuff i might say if i spend 10 pounds now on a machine i might get an extra 10 pounds per hour from my workers in the future. So I'll spend £10 now and get a lot more output, you know, value of output later. So that's investment. I'm sure you know what savings are, but the main thing you need to remember is that they are a leakage, they're a withdrawal from the circular flow, because once money's being saved, it isn't being spent, it isn't part of income going round and round, it's just sitting in a bank somewhere collecting dust. Um, savings are actually quite income induced so when incomes rise people have more money to so think oh I'm going to save and when incomes fall people are already spending all of their money on their essentials so they've got no money left to save that's why savings fall when incomes fall savings will also increase in times of economic uncertainty so for example if I'm in a job and I'm not 100% sure if I'm going to keep it I'm not going to be spending all my money in case I lose my job, so I'll put it all in a bank, you know, it's just in reserve, just in case. And if the worst comes to the worst, and I, well, if the best comes to the best, I suppose, and I keep my job, I've got all that money safe there for a rainy day. There are some really, really, really important equations, I suppose you might want to call them, that you need to learn. So when injections are equal to withdrawals, what's coming in is what's going out. National income is in equilibrium, it's not changing. There's the same amount of money, I suppose, income, going around in the system. But when injections are greater than withdrawals, national income is rising because more money is coming into the system than is going out. And obviously when injections are less than withdrawals, it therefore follows that national income will fall because more money is leaving than is coming in. Another important equation is that when planned saving is equal to planned investment, national income remains in equilibrium. On there you might be able to see government expenditure. The government spends on a lot of different things. 
defence, policing, social securities like benefits and stuff like that, healthcare, education, and one big one is the interest it has to pay on money that we borrowed ages ago. A really exciting idea that's related to national income is the multiplier effect. So when spending increases, there's a larger than proportional change in national income. So when there's an increase in spending, more demand, employment rises, so more people have more money basically. Whatever you do, don't mix this up with the accelerator effect, which is the relationship between a change in your investment and a change in the rate of national income. So when national income rises, investment rises. It's totally different. Don't mix them up. Aggregate demand is made up of a lot of different things, as we saw in the first video, such as consumption, investment, government spending, exports minus imports. When the three first parts of aggregate demand, consumption, investment and government spending are equal, oh I just kicked my plant over, uh, are equal to income, the economy remains in equilibrium because the amount that people are demanding is the amount that they can afford. Arguably the most important constituent, is it constituent? No. Ingredient, I don't know what you want to call it, of aggregate demand is consumption which makes up 60% of aggregate demand, although this figure does vary slightly depending on which textbook or source you're using. But if you're writing an essay and you're writing about the importance of consumption, 60% is a decent figure to use. So that's, you know, what people are spending. So that's why it's important and we'll come on to the factors that cause the changes in the level of consumption in a second. We also have disposable income, which is... I suppose what you use to consume goods or services because the disposable income is the income you have left after you've made all your statutory deductions, so you've paid your income tax and stuff like that. That's the money you've got left which you're going to go and consume with, you're going to go buy stuff with or save. So that's what you use for your consumption. There are a lot of different factors that cause changes in the level of consumption. One of them is the wealth effect. This is to do with the value of houses. Now, as we know, the values of houses can fluctuate quite dramatically over quite a long time periods. They can go from very, very expensive houses, you know, they can be really quite expensive, and then they suddenly drop to being very cheap. So we've got the housing bubble, which will grow and grow and grow, and then suddenly burst. So when the value of houses is increasing, consumers can borrow against the value of the house. They think, oh, well, I've got loads of money because my house is worth so much, if the worst comes to us, I'll just sell it. So consumption increases within the economy. And if you wanted to, you could draw a diagram showing the effect that this has on aggregate demand. Obviously, I don't think we've actually drawn diagrams of aggregate demand supply yet. That's in the next video. But it's very easy to draw, so hopefully you'll be okay with that. And if the value of the house falls, consumers feel worse off. They think, oh my god, what am I going to do? My house isn't worth anything. You can get negative equity, which is obviously a really bad thing. And everyone feels really worse off, and they reduce their consumption. They don't spend so much. They hold back because they how can they be spending when they've got such a massive like negative equity they've made a massive loss in buying this house if inflation is expected to rise it's about to get worse all prices are going to rise a lot consumers will increase their spending quite quickly they'll increase their consumption simply because they fear that prices are going to rise even more in the future anticipatory buying so they'll buy like say that i've got a tv now i can buy it 500 quid but in a year's time, inflation's so bad that it's going to be a thousand quid. I'm going to buy it now. I'm not going to wait. So consumption can increase quite dramatically when inflation is expected to rise. The rate of interest is quite a nice, easy one to explain. When there's a low rate of interest, it's cheap to borrow. So borrowing increases and consumption increases. Also, if there's a low rate of interest, it means people think, ah, there's no point in saving my money. I may as well go splash it because if I put it in the bank, I'm not going to get anything extra. So I'll spend it now. So spending increases and that's consumption. So consumption and aggregate demand increases. However, if there's a high interest rate, it's expensive to borrow. So borrowing decreases. People think, oh, I may as well save. So they save their money. And that means that consumption overall decreases because people just don't have as much money. That's called the constriction. Constrictionary? Constricting monetary effect. Monetary effect? Monetary policy. I'm jumbling all my words together now. And um, we'll come to that later, I believe. Quite exciting stuff, that is. And finally, expectations. If the consumer expects the future to be good, they're like, woohoo, gonna be a fabulous future, gonna get a new promotion, new job, blah, blah, blah. They will increase their consumption, they'll feel richer, they'll feel wealthier, they'll feel better off. They think, oh, there's no worries, no financial worries. They'll just spend, 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 spend. Which means they've got a lot of goods, but I suppose if it all crumbles and goes wrong, then they're left with absolutely no money whatsoever. So that's reasons why consumption could increase. But then if people have got negative expectations, oh no, I'm going to lose my job next week, I'm not going to have any money, my house value is about to plummet, 
then they will increase their saving and decrease their consumption because they'll think, oh, I need to save just in case all of this happens, which is why more negative people actually tend to have more like money saved. They're more prepared for disasters because they're more aware that they might occur. Anyway, I hope this video helped. Good luck in your exam. Have a lovely day. Bye. Ah, Just clip my ankle out of place, not my ankle, my elbow. Oh, shut up, Danny.